السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. إن شاء الله I will commence with a short recitation from the Quran for purposes of barakah and blessings. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا السماء فطرت وإذا الكواكب تثرت وإذا البحار فجرت وإذا القبور بعثرت علمت نفس ما قدمت وأخرت يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء ركبك كلا بل تكذبون بالدين وإن عليكم لحافظين كراما كاتبين كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم وإن الفجار لفي جحيم يصلونها يوم الدين وما هم عنها بغائبين وما أدراك ما يوم الدين ثم ما أدراك ما يوم الدين يوم لا تم نفس لنفس شيئا والأمر يومئذ لله صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عباده الذين اصطفى All praise is due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless him and all his companions and may he bless us all as well اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن بطن لا يشبع ومن دعاء لا يسمع Oh Allah, we ask you to grant us knowledge that is beneficial and we ask you to protect us from knowledge that we will make no use of. And we ask you to protect us from eyes that will not cry for your sake. And we ask you to protect us from a heart that will not tremble in your fear. And we ask you to protect us from a stomach and a soul that will not be fulfilled and content. And we ask you to protect us from those prayers that are not answered. Ameen. Honorable ulama, beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, this evening's topic is connected to the parent-child relationship. And in order to address this topic, we need to first understand that we have to look at the parent-parent relationship first and then the relationship 
between the children themselves, the child, the inter-child inter relationship, and the relationship between the parents and the children. This topic is a very vast topic. Every one of us seated here are children of someone. We all have parents. None of us can say we do not have parents. Some, the parents may have passed on. They may have passed away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on them. Whereas others, their parents may be alive. And from amongst those whose parents are alive, some may be living with them. And some may not be living with them. In every case, we are taught a lot when it comes to the Sharia. Ah. It is just that sometimes we take it for granted or sometimes we don't understand or sometimes we don't want to know what Islam says when it comes to these relationships. I'd like to commence with an incident that occurred at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu where there was an old man he came forth complaining about his child and he said O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen I have a child who is disobedient I have a child who does this I have a child who does that and he said a whole list of things and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu listened to the old man and then called the boy, called the young child and tried to advise him saying, do you know what? Your father is complaining about you and you need to fulfill the rights of your father. You need to fulfill the rights of your father. So the young boy says, can I ask a question? And Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, Yes, you can ask a question. What is it? He says, Do I not have any rights? What are my rights? You know, nowadays people like to hear the word rights. What are my rights? I need to know my rights. So the young boy is asking, What are my rights? I'd like to know that. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu explained to the young boy what his rights were and that is very interesting because tonight we will all see a new dimension some of us may be knowing this incident the first right that the child has is for the parent to select a good spouse subhanallah so before the child ever came into existence, it was already the right of your unborn children who were not even mentioned that you had chosen a decent mother for them. That is something very deep. No religion goes into this depth. So it is the right of our children that we married somebody decent. One of the reasons is, obviously, when you have married someone decent, it becomes much easier for the child to then be brought up in a decent fashion, in a decent manner. Whereas when marriage was only for beauty, or it was only for wealth, or it was for the wrong reasons, for example, Sometimes we can ask ourselves, what do you expect from this? If, for example, a man has married a woman who doesn't even know how to speak, who swears and shouts, then what type of behavior would that man expect his children to have? In order to remedy this, in the Sharia, we are taught that it is the right of your unborn children. Even prior to your marriage, 
It is the right of those who will be born to you if you ever do have children. That you select a good spouse. And this is not only for men, but even for women. That is why a few days back, in one of my talks, I made mention of the fact that when you are selecting a spouse, in a nutshell, ask yourself, is this person fit to be the mother of my children? Is this person fit to be the father of my children? And I hope that the youngsters who are not yet married, young boys and girls, I hope we can take a lesson from this. We don't need to go for the next most beautiful woman. We don't need to go for the next most beautiful woman. But we rather go for a person who is beautiful from inside. And a person who is fit to be the parent of our children. Meaning either the mother or the father. Like I said moments ago, the young boys who want to get married need to ask themselves, is this person that I'd like to marry fit to be the mother of my children? And in the case of a female, is this person fit to be the father of my children when she is selecting or she is deciding whether or not to marry someone? That is the first issue. So the fact that we have married correctly is already part and parcel The fact that we have married correctly is already part and parcel of the right of the unborn child being full, meaning the unborn child being fulfilled. That is of utmost importance. The second issue mentioned by Umar ibn al-Khattab, he says, it was the right of your father to give you a good name, to name you with a brilliant name. These good names, obviously we have names that have a good meaning. We have names of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have names that are mentioned in the Quran. We have other names that really have a very, very good meaning to the degree that you would be proud to call your child with that name. Is it that we still want to choose names that just sound Western? In my part of the world, people come and ask questions. Can I name my child this? Can I name my child that? And believe me, as the years are passing and as the world is progressing, we find Muslims wanting to stay away from Islamic names. For whatever reasons, they are worried, my child must not be associated with Islam. May Allah protect us. Some people have that notion where they think that I'd rather name the child something which will sound more Western. And they will debate with you. Why can't I name the child this and that? The reality is it's the child's right that you choose a good name because at that age the child has no understanding you don't want the child to grow up cursing you that you know the name I've got is very bad if any name has the possibility or probability of having a bad meaning in Islam we are taught to abstain from it when I say having a bad meaning if it has a possibility of having a bad meaning in any language. For example, you might have an Arabic name which has a good meaning in Arabic. But in your native language, that name might sound like a swear word. It has happened in some languages. You have an Arabic name, but it sounds very bad in our language. In that case, it would be the right of the child that you abstain from that name. Not because it has a bad meaning in Arabic, but because it has a bad meaning in other languages. 
and you wouldn't like the child, for example, you wouldn't like that child to grow up thinking and saying, why did my father name me with this name? So that is the second right that was mentioned. And the third right is, and Umar ibn al-Khattab is telling this little boy, that as you grew up, the first things to be taught to you should have been the Qur'an. The first things to be taught to you should have been the Qur'an, the word of the Creator who created you. So the young boy looks and says, you know, Umar ibn al-Khattab, you are Amirul Mu'mineen. I'd like to tell you my father has not fulfilled any, any of these rights of mine. And he only stopped at these three. Imagine if he had to go on and on. He says, firstly, he married someone off the street who had a very bad record. May Allah protect us. Very bad record. Secondly, he gave me such a terrible name. And up to now, I don't even know what the Quran is all about. There we are. So then Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu diverted the admonition to the father. Saying, you are coming to complain about your child. You are the one who has not even fulfilled any of the rights of the child. And you are coming to say, my child is disobedient and my child is this and my child is that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. So I've used this incident as a prelude to the talk. We have in the Sharia and in Islam so much that is mentioned about how a person should be living. Every aspect of my life and your lives is covered in Islam. And we are taught that a strong relation between the spouses will result in a positive upbringing of the children. If the mother and the father, the two of them get on well, naturally the children will be having a more holistic upbringing. That is something we need to understand. It is taught to us in the Sharia. And that is why, and I'm going to start mentioning the points that I'd like to talk about this evening one by one. The first point is, it is very important that whenever we have a difference between ourselves as parents, don't ever allow your children to witness the argument between the two. Never. If you have to say something to your wife, or if a wife has to say something to the husband that is a little bit heavy, a little bit hard, do it after the doors are closed and locked in your own room when nobody and none of your children are watching. Because if you are to vent your frustrations in the presence of your child, you are doing a disservice to those children. They will grow up thinking that that is normal. Arguments are normal. Swearing is normal. Getting angry is normal. And then as they grow up, if they don't get angry and if they don't swear and shout, then what do you expect them to do? Do you expect them to suddenly know that you are not supposed to do this when every day they have been watching their own parents doing the same thing? That is a very valid point and we need to consider it, contemplate. Because if we take a careful look at the problems that we are facing now across the globe, many parents are not fit to be parents. Really, many people have married and they still have a lot of rectification and suddenly they have children. They themselves, who need to guide the children, need guidance. That is where, what we are faced with nowadays. You have parents who have suddenly become parents, but they don't know what parenthood is all about. Because the responsibility that comes with a child is very great, and they think it's a joke. And in order to address this, we need to go a little bit deeper 
to resolve the matters and to between the children and the parents and to try and give the children the best of upbringings we need to know that the husband and wife themselves need to have a sense of responsibility and that sense of maturity and responsibility will only come when you are disciplined when you are strict on yourself so many times you have young boys I'm not so sure of the girls but I can talk for the boys you have young boys who have their friends they sit with their friends up to 12 at night and 2 in the morning then a few years later they get married and when they get married they still find themselves making the same time for their friends that is prohibited completely prohibited how can a person how can a person who has now taken somebody's daughter still give preference to his friends over his own wife and this is a sickness that many people are guilty of the time that you spend with your spouse is an act of worship in Islam the time that you spend with your family members is an act of worship in Islam so many people give preference to their businesses over their family members. Many people just sit and give preference to a newspaper over their family members. It's a fact. The man comes home from work, he is tired, he does not speak to anyone, he sits down, he wants to eat his food, he has a temper and next thing he is busy reading the paper or he literally plants himself in front of the television and he is watching television until late hours, then he switches it off and goes to sleep. He hasn't spoken to his wife, he hasn't spoken to his children. If any one of us here are guilty of that, today is the day you are being told directly that that is a major sin. Major sin. How can you give preference to a television over real people? Real people. Another problem is also the internet. Many people give preference to the internet and spend hours every day until 2 and 3 in the morning laughing and joking with a screen. If you want them to laugh, really, you've got to put a screen in front of them. They will see what is known as emoticons. You know what is an emoticon? Those small little faces that you have on the screen. Small cartoon style faces. They look at someone who sent them a, an emoticon and they laugh. But if you talk to them, they will look at you and say, Hey, I'm busy. And I want to give you an example of a very good friend of mine, one of my best friends very very highly educated and he was so intelligent he had 13 A's at O level and 4 A's at A level he was given a scholarship at the University of Oxford some years later I met him I told him you know tell me what has Allah done with you meaning you know what has happened in your life he tells me brother I gave up the internet I said that doesn't make sense I asked him about himself and he's just telling me I gave up the internet. So I said, what do you mean? He said, that is the biggest single achievement of my life. And I'm, I was confused. This was a few years back when the internet was still something new. Now he told me he became a doctor. He actually became a psychiatrist later. He specialized. He told me, you know what happened to me? I was married and I was addicted to the internet and I was sitting with the internet every day every single day for six to seven hours and I became a person whose social life was the net all my friends were, were on the internet all the people I spoke to were on the internet I ate and mostly I even asked for the plate of food to come in front of the screen so I would eat whilst I'm busy typing whilst I'm busy looking and so on and he says, I lost my wife in the sense that she left him. She deserted him after some time. 
Why? Because if you are not going to give due attention to your wife, who do you want her to get that from? That's a question. Many people are guilty of not spending lighter moments even with their own wives. Where do they want that wife to go and get that from? It is true and we need to talk about it because so many women are suffering in silence. It's a fact of life. They are too embarrassed to mention what is going on. And that is the beginning of the problem. Imagine the children that come out of such a relationship. What warped upbringing will they have? What type of a relation will there be between parent and child when the parent parent relation is non-existent? So many people are guilty of not understanding that they have taken someone's daughter with the name of Allah. When we are officiating a nikah, you and I know that there are certain verses that are read. I'm sure you all know those verses. All of those verses have the consciousness of Allah mentioned in them. And I feel, and let's listen to this very carefully, that the most important verse is the third verse that is read. Ya ayyuha O oh, you who believe, be conscious of your Rabb, be conscious of your Creator, be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and only utter that which is upright, that which is straight, that which is full of happiness, that which is full of contentment, that which is full of truthfulness, that which is away from falsehood, that which is away from deception, that which is not vulgar at all. That is the meaning of the term Sadeed, and Sadeed means that which is straight. It will result in all forms of goodness and it will keep you away from all forms of bad and evil. Why is this verse repeated when we are getting married? Can I inform you of one of the reasons? One of the reasons is that do you know that 90% of your problems are caused by the tongue? 90% of any human being's problems are caused by the tongue. So Allah is saying, watch out. Be careful how you use that tongue of yours, especially in marriage. The question I have, how many of us utter words to make our spouses feel good? How many of us utter words to put a smile on the faces of our spouses on a daily basis? I think a lot of us are guilty of never doing that or doing it very little. Every single day, it would be an act of worship for myself and yourselves to say a few words to make your spouse smile, both male and female. An act of worship. If we don't do that, we will have a hollow society. Outwardly, everything seems to be okay. Inside, nothing is okay. And people are suffering in silence. Why do we need people to suffer in silence? We don't. No one needs to suffer. Do you know that you need to praise your spouse on their faces even if you are telling a lie? Sometimes what happens is the food is prepared. It takes hours to prepare especially here in Sri Lanka I don't know there are more than 20 dishes when you sit to eat it takes a long time to prepare and then a lot of men have a sickness a lot of men have a sickness and I think we are all guilty of it to a certain extent where not only do we forget to utter words of appreciation but we will only pick on what is wrong with the food not realizing that there was so much effort that was put. Now the salt sometimes, the salt might have become a little bit more in the food for whatever reason. And we say, you know, the salt is too much in the food. Not realizing that it took four hours to make that. Are you living for salt? 
Is your life rotating around salt? No, it isn't. So what you need to do is, and what I need to do is, appreciate it by saying, you know, the food is so lovely. Really, it's very good. Even if you are telling a little bit of a lie. And my dear mothers and sisters, don't worry. When your husbands are telling you that, it will be true. It won't be a lie. How many of us have told our wives or our husbands, you are looking very beautiful today. You are looking very handsome today. A lot of us are guilty of thinking that in Islam, you're not even allowed to say that. The Prophet ﷺ used to tell that to his wives regularly. He used to explain to them and express to them with greatest passion how beautiful they were looking. Subhanallah. And he told others as well how good his wife was and his wives were. I mentioned the hadith a few days ago. He said himself about Aisha radiallahu anha, Fadlu Aishati ka fadli thariidi ala sa'ir ta'am. He said the virtue of Aisha is like the virtue of the, the, the special Arabian dish of food when all the other food is there. Which means she's the best woman at this moment in time. He speaks about Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha. He used to praise her on her face and he praised her in her absence to others. And he constantly mentioned her even close to his death. He was mentioning Khadija binti Khuwailid radiallahu anha. Because she was the one who comforted him when he came down with revelation. When he came down from the mount and he had revelation. What did she say at that point? She praised him. He had a difficult time. And she praised him. She said, you know, Allah will never let you down. You are such a good man. You are such a good husband. You are so brilliant. You go out of your way to help people. You are so truthful. You are so honest. You are so forthcoming. You are so positive. Allah will never let you down. That's what the hadith says. She praised him. How many wives can praise their husbands? Well, then again, they might argue with me and say they are not like the Prophet If they were like that, we would have praised them. But the question I have, and this is to ponder over, my dearest brothers and sisters, if you are not going to utter sentences and statements, praising your own spouse and telling them how good and beautiful and handsome they are, and how gorgeous and awesome they are looking, who is going to do that? Are you waiting for the neighbor to come and tell that to your wife? And it happens. It happens. And sometimes the neighbor might say it in your presence. What an embarrassment. Oh, your wife is looking so gorgeous today. Allahu Akbar. That is now un-Islamic. That is now un-Islamic. But that statement will have an impact on this woman. If it's the first time she's hearing that. Or if she hasn't heard it in a long, long time. But if you utter it every day, then the most, if you utter it every day, then even if the, the most handsome of princes comes and tells her how beautiful she is looking, it won't have an impact on her because she hears that word every day from you. This is very important. A lot of Muslims sadly believe inside their hearts that no, when we are Muslims, you know, you need to stay away from certain things. No, believe me. When it comes to your intimate relations and your wife and your spouse, you need to understand that Islam has taught us much more than any other religion. Subhanallah. Very important. This is what enhances the relationship. Moments ago, I mentioned about time. How people give preference to their friends. This friend of mine told me that I realized only after it was too late that I was wrong. It was too late. Why was he wrong? He says, I was mixing with people who were not real. And in the process, I sacrificed the real people around me. My own parents, my own wife, 
my own brothers and sisters, I sacrificed them because I was busy on the net every time. The question I have for all of us is how many of us are guilty of exceeding the limits when it comes to the internet? Spending so much time, I'm not saying it's wrong to go and check your email or to do something constructive. The minute you waste time, you need to understand that now you are giving preference to something over a reality that is around you. There are people waiting for you. Do you know mostly what happens in our homes? The women folk do not go to work. The men go to work. This poor woman who is a new bride sometimes, or she's a wife who's been there for many years, she's got a child. From the time you leave to work, she is busy thinking about you and she is trying to prepare a meal for you. She is, uh, you know, looking after the child or the children, for example, and she is looking forward to you coming. When you come, you know, she, she has certain plans maybe in place. She wants to smile at you and maybe have a nice big hug as soon as you enter and so on. But sometimes when we enter the homes as men, we give them such a dirty look that their whole mountain comes crumbling. They had so many things planned, but suddenly it comes crashing. Why? Because we made a very big mistake. We came in with the wrong attitude. She has been sitting alone waiting all day for you to come home so that she can share a moment or two with you and you come home and you share those moments with the television. And many people have this habit. They sit and watch the news and that's it. And I know that there are people in here who must be thinking this man is addressing me. Believe me, this is a common problem across the globe. And we are here as ulama to help people identify and diagnose the problems. The divorce rates are so high because people don't know what marriage is all about. When you marry, you need to stop giving your friends preference. You know, we had a young boy who married and I happened to talk to him and I even gave a lecture at his nikah. And I had said there that we must give preference to our wives over our friends. We have to. There is no option. As Muslims, we must give preference to our wives over our friends. Because one is more important than the other. Your friends have other friends. Your friends have you also, but you don't have to spend so long with them. But your wife, you are the only husband for her. And what had happened is, this boy, because of the lecture that was delivered at his nikah, he decided that he is going to adopt it and he sidelined a lot of his friends. Let's listen, it's a very interesting story. When he sidelined a lot of his friends, they began to tell him, you're a chicken, you know, you're petticoat government, you know, you're, you know, you don't wear the pants, you know, and so on. And uh, what happened is he came to me because it was pressure for him. Imagine your friends every day are telling you, they message you, uh, or they phone you, they say, you're petticoat, you're gone, you know, you're a goner. You know, you'd rather call her Mr. and you should call yourself Mrs. and so on. So he came to me. I told him, I said, listen, brother, tell them that I don't mind you calling me a chicken or a frog. So long as I'm happy in my marriage, because the day my marriage doesn't work, you are not going to come and resolve the matter for me. But I will not lose you as friends if you were true friends. And if you are true friends, you will send the married man home. You know, some people, when they are married and they are sitting with you, at 10 o'clock they'll tell you, look, I need to go. And everyone starts laughing. Everyone starts laughing. But I say, so what? The whole world can laugh so long as you are happy. Is there anything wrong? The whole world can laugh at you, but your marriage is working and their marriages are not working because when they get home, may Allah protect us, they have a disaster. One sleeps facing one direction and the other sleeps facing the other direction. Is that what marriage is all about? May Allah protect us all. And may Allah grant us the true understanding. So this solid relationship that is there or supposed to be there between the spouses is what will result then in a solid upbringing of the children because they will not get 
differing views and opinions. They will not be confused. When a child sees different things from the mother, different things from the father, and the child sees opposing views and conflict between the two, the child is confused. And after that, what happens is that child then finds comfort outside the house. Outside the house. Because in the house, there is chaos. In the house, there is confusion. So the child then wants to find comfort at school or with some friends, especially the female child, sometimes very silent, very emotional. But at the same time, they may then be caught unaware. May Allah protect us. And that brings me to another point. When we have a child in the house, this is for those men who are married, who have children. And don't worry the women folk, your turn is coming. You know, a lot of the men must be thinking this man is blasting us. Don't worry. We start with those who are right near here. A lot of people are guilty of not understanding what is meant by pregnancy and what is meant by bearing a child. A lot of men don't understand that. And what type of difficulties a woman goes through in order to bear your child and immediately after birth we show disinterest in that same female why because she's got a little bit of fat now a little bit of flab on her belly for example she's got three or four more stretch marks there and she probably might not get back into exactly the shape she was it's a fact so now what happens a lot of men then after the first child or two their eyes begin to wander here and there and they start saying oh this woman is so pretty look at that woman why are you hurting the feelings of your own wife it is haram in islam to praise another woman it is haram in islam to praise another woman in the presence of your own spouse why would you like to praise another woman for what especially speaking about her figure we are not even meant to be looking in that direction imagine a woman who got married to you and she was in quite good shape you made her pregnant really and she got your child and after bearing your child you now want to praise other women to say no those women have a good shape you know May Allah protect us. These are matters that need to be spoken about. Because a lot of people need this. A lot of people don't even know that in the Sharia, we are taught all these issues. You cannot just lose interest in your spouse solely because now she's given birth. If she has given birth, do you know how high a status of a woman who is pregnant is? And the status of a woman who is giving birth is there are so many evidences from the Sharia to prove her status but I want to give you one if she passes away in the condition of pregnancy or in the condition of childbirth she will get paradise without account without account of her deeds she's forgiven totally and she's given paradise straight through the green root, so to speak. Imagine if Allah Almighty is telling the woman that for you to endure childbirth, your level is raised so much that if you were to die in that condition, you will go to paradise. And we as men are sitting and thinking it's a big crime. You know Why? Because now I don't like what she looks like after she gave birth. I am repeating this because it is happening in many, many homes. And a lot of the times it is happening silently. And other matters that occur which create confusion for the children is the relationship we have with our in-laws. When we have a healthy relationship with our in-laws, then naturally the children will have a healthy relationship with us as well. But when there is chaos and confusion, when it comes to the relationship with in-laws, in that particular case, there will be chaos and confusion when it comes to our own children. Let me inform you, in Islam, once a couple are married, 
you don't interfere with their decisions you don't interfere with their decisions even if it is your son or your daughter you can try and suggest something to them but it is wrong for you to make decisions for them and this message is for parents who have children who are married Parents who have children who are married need to understand that let them live their lives. Let them make their decisions. When you were young, you made your decisions. Now it's their turn to make their decisions. Their children's upbringing is their business, not yours. Now they are married. They need to start a life of their own. Many marriages are suffering great turbulence. A lot of them even break because of interference from parents on both sides and it's a fact it really is a fact across the globe this is a problem and we don't understand as muslims take a look at the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he never ever interfered he never ever interfered with any of his daughters husbands and he never interfered in their lives not even once i want to give you one true example of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. You know his daughter was Aisha radiallahu anha. She was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day he passed the room of Aisha radiallahu anha. One day Abu Bakr who is the father of Aisha passed the room of Aisha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there and they were Aisha radiallahu anha had raised her voice and it was sounded like it was like a discussion with a debate. It sounded like that. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he knocked the door. He was allowed to go in. He was permitted to go in. He went in. He did not ask questions. You know, most of us, when there is a problem, with our children and their spouses, we side with our children. Some people say, my daughter is right, always, you are wrong. And some people say, my son is right, you are wrong. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu did not ask questions. He didn't even know what was happening. He thought there is a debate going on here. My daughter is being disrespectful. He went in and he admonished her. He admonished her. He admonished her to the degree that she began to weep. Then he went away. Few minutes later, he was passing the same room and he heard them laughing. He heard them laughing. So he knocked the door and he says, Ashrikani, this is the Arabic term. Can you make me, can you allow me to take part in your peace in the same way you made me take part in your war a few minutes ago? Moments ago, I came in and I took part in your war, which means the term war is used, but it was not a war, meaning when there was a problem, I came in. Now, when you people are happy, can I come in again? And the Prophet ﷺ began to laugh and he explained to him, look, there was no problem at all. You overreacted. There was no problem at all. But why I'm mentioning this is, if we are to interfere, it should only be to rectify our side. That's, who, that's the interference. To rectify, to admonish, to be strict. But we cannot begin to make decisions for others. You know, many women, many women complain that sometimes our in-laws don't allow us to be mothers. What does that mean? I'm talking about my part of the world. But I'm sure even in Sri Lanka, everyone has five fingers, isn't it? So we've got the same problems. The poor lady has had a child. Now, normally there is a postnatal depression that a lot of women go through because of the vast sudden change in body. And one person says, you know what, give the child formula milk. 
The other person says, give the child this type of milk. The other one says, breastfeed the child like this. The other one says, no, give them water. The, other, the poor lady is totally confused. What do I do? You'll find a whole bucket of all sorts of things and every little while she's trying one thing and the other. And the child is all sick now. Why? Because there is chaos. Let the mother do what she wants. Really, you can advise her, you can tell her, but you cannot instruct her. She is the mother. And some people get so passionate, they don't allow mothers to be mothers. They want to be the mothers. Everyone wants to be the mother. And this is a sickness. It is happening across the globe. We need to rectify it because we will not be able to move forward and progress as Muslims unless and until we understand what parenthood is all about. Imagine I have to interfere in my grandchildren every time and that trend continues for generations and generations. So rather the grandparents decide that we are now the parents finished. We, we can change the terminology and call parents grandparents and grandparents parents with all due respect to grandparents. Then there is another problem and that is the sandwich that a lot of men are put into. Why? Because on one hand you have your parents. Those are your parents. You are the child. And on the other hand you have your wife and your children. Now where to go? Because now there is a discrepancy between the two. Should I listen to my parents or should I listen to my wife? You are now a parent yourself. Your parents have a position which will never ever drop in Islam. They have a very high lofty position. But where they are reasonable, you will listen to what they say. Where they are not reasonable, you will explain to them like a man. To say, that, do you know what? Thank you very much. I really appreciate your advice and so on. Even if you don't want to tell them, you, you know, I'm not going to accept what you're saying. Don't say that. Tell them, no, I understand, I appreciate, I've heard what you said and you know, Jazakumullah, thank you very much for your advice and so on. But where they are unreasonable, you do not have to take it. You only take that which is reasonable. Sometimes some people say, look, you know what? And this is a fact. My mother comes first because paradise lies under her feet. I agree. Your mother definitely does come first. But if the paradise is there in the first place, some mothers have hell beneath their feet. May Allah protect us. What this means is, if her life is un-Islamic, what paradise do you want under her feet? She will begin to tell you to do things which are detrimental to your own self. Then you want to use this excuse to continue listening to what she is saying. She will land you in the same place she has landed. So paradise beneath the feet is correct only when we ensure that whatever we are saying or doing is within the limits of Islam. And what I am telling you this evening is connected to Islam. We are Muslims. Many people have so many problems. You know, today we are speaking about parent child relation. Are you seeing how I have brought into the topic how parents themselves are children of others? So the parent-child relation can, can go through for a few generations sometimes. If you have a great-grandparent who's alive, then there is a parent-child, parent-child, parent-child relation of three generations. Where do you draw the line? You need to give the freedom to those who are married to live their lives according to what they feel is correct on condition that it is within the Islamic limits. The minute they decide we don't want to read Salah, you tackle them. The minute they decide we don't want to dress Islamically, you tackle them. You can interfere. The minute they decide we don't want to read the Quran and the Sunnah, you tackle them. You can interfere. But whether or not they want to eat out or in is not your business. They go out, let them go. Be happy for them. Be happy for them. If they decide we want to go for on a holiday to Hawaii, let them go on holiday. Be happy for them. If they decide, for example, that we would like to, 
we would like to go out maybe for a lecture of this nature. We can't say, look, there'll be no one at home, so you sit, I'm going. Would that be fair? Well, it depends obviously on the situation in the house. In Islam, we are taught that rather the person who's talking stays. So, we have so many issues in the Sharia that are discussed, which are relevant to my life and yours, if only we knew. Now let's take a look at a few more aspects of the parent-parent relationship. I mentioned a point where I said, whenever you have an argument, make sure that it is not in the presence of the children. Make sure. That is the most harmful act for the children to have a big argument. I have come across cases where they have been boxing bouts, fighting and beating in front of children. Then that child goes to school and beats up all the other children. So naturally when you, when you are a teacher at school and you find the child beating up all other children, it is a sign that there is something wrong in their house. It's a sign. Something is wrong. If there is no love between the spouses, what love is there going to be for the child? We need to create this love. We need to make sure it is there. Another point is that whenever we speak, we should speak with utmost respect to our spouses. Utmost respect. And make sure the children watch that and they see that. My father speaks very well to my mother and my mother addresses my father with a lot of respect. The child will learn respect automatically. The child will learn respect without you having to tell them anything because that is what they've been watching every day. Whatever the child watches, that's what the child does. If you read your salah on a daily basis, the child will automatically come up and want to read salah at the age of one and two and will go into the posture of sajda without anyone saying anything. I'm sure you have seen that happening. If you dress properly and appropriately, your children will dress appropriately. But if you have not dressed proper, properly and appropriately, what do you expect from your children? A woman who wants to wear clothing that is unacceptable, for example, then she makes dua to Allah, Ya Allah, keep my children modest. She is being foolish. Because she needs to be the example of her own children. Parents need to be the role models of their own children. I don't know how bad the problem of smoking is in this country, but even a person who wants to smoke must never do so in the presence of their children, no matter what, never. Because it is such a bad habit. If we are smoking in front of them, to them, they might be on drugs in front of us. May Allah protect us. It gets worse as time passes. The best of generations is mine and then the next and then the next. Which means as the generations are passing, they are generally becoming worse. The disrespect and disobedience is becoming much more. And we should remember that when we do something, our children will do the same to us. How you treat your parents, so your children shall treat you. How you treat your parents, so your children shall treat you. There was a certain man whose father used to visit him, a rich man. And because he, his father was a villager, quite dirty and smelly, because you know when a person is a villager dealing with the goats and the chickens, sometimes their clothing is not smelling so good and so on. 
he did not used to allow his father in the house rather he used to uh, have a place outside near the chicken run and he used to call his father and say oh come come have a seat and so on and he used to give him a blanket there and he used to sleep there outside the house and what happened is years later obviously his son was watching all this years later after the father passed away and so on he once visited his son and when he visited his son the son threw a blanket to him and said dad you know what to do he said what do you mean he said you're my dad isn't it so daddies are meant to be in the chicken run and the father began to weep and he says we had scholars of islam who came to us telling us kama tadinu tudanu how you treat that's how you shall be treated and i never believed it and today my own son is throwing a blanket at me telling me daddy you know what to do which means get out now and go to the chicken run allahu akbar that's just an example but it happens in our lives where we do things believe me the circle completes itself at some stage it will come back to us it will come back to us don't think that when we are bad it's not going to come back it will definitely come back and if you don't want it to come back engage in toba repent and mend your ways here and now it won't come back we are taught that when you help someone cross the street Allah will create someone to help you cross the street the day you need it. Or Allah will give you such good health that you won't need anyone to help you cross the street. That's what we are taught. So if we are good, for example, to our parents and so on, and if we are good to our spouses, Allah will create people who will be good to us. But if we are bad, Allah will create people who will be bad to us. I mentioned yesterday the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi the best from amongst you are those who are best to his or her spouses in particular and family members at large I think that hadith needs to be written a hundred times by us really because many people think that we need to please everyone around us outside which means at work and on the street and so on people must think good of us but at home really the relationship is not even there we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding and as I said if we are not going to create that environment within the home where is it going to come from how a person disappears from the house for so long for a long long time he doesn't come home where where is or where are the family members going to derive that figure from that fatherly figure from may Allah protect us all now if we move on to the the relationship of the children themselves within each other it is very important that the children themselves are made to understand that they are equal favoritism of one child is a very big crime totally prohibited completely haram many people are guilty of it many children feel that my brother or my mother my 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 brother or my sister is much more loved by my parents than myself many children feel that that feeling is a dangerous feeling it results in a warped upbringing of the child very dangerous haram in islam the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says if you are going to give one sweet to one child and you have 10 you need to give all of them all of them equally fair you are not allowed to favor one child over the others never so much so that I have read certain books which say that when you are naming your children try to keep similar names so none of your children must think my name is so small and short and look at my brother's got such a wonderful name Allahu Akbar that is justice and equality when it comes to your children even from naming them 
So if you have a double barrel name for the first three children, why do you want to have a singular name for the fourth child? The child might grow up thinking, what did my father do? Even after you are dead, he might curse you. Keep it quite similar. May Allah grant us understanding. I have had a case where there was a young boy called Ali who came to me and said, my father doesn't like me. And you know, children, when they speak to you, they are sincere. They have their points. And I said, why? He said, look, to start with, he, he named me Ali. I said, that's a beautiful name. He said, but my brother is called Dhul Karnain. I said, so? He said, that's such a long name. Beauty. Mine is only three letters. A-L-I, finished. And his is so long. Now, the truth is, there's nothing wrong with that. But look at what he did to the child. My father doesn't love me. To start with, he says, this was my name. Then he sent me to a government school and my brother went to a private school. Allahu Akbar. Look at that. Look at that. So when we are sending our children to schools, we need to send them to the same school. So I told him, but why did your father do that? He says, because my brother is clever. Maybe I'm not that clever. So my father wants him to become a doctor. So send him to a private school. And with me, I don't know what he wants me to become. Imagine little children understand. It is very dangerous to favor one child. Very dangerous. Don't ever have a favorite child. Never. It is prohibited in Islam. That's my, you are my favorite child. Don't ever say that. Never. All your children are favorite, no matter what. In fact, the one who is slightly slower, give them slightly more attention. Another point is the issue of communication between the parents and the children. Many times, the parents don't realize that the world is changing. Many times the parents don't realize that the world is progressing and changing. So the type of problems faced by the new generation will be different from the types of problems that were faced by the older generation. They might come to you with something very absurd. Deal with it correctly. Don't deal with it in such a way that they stop telling you what's happening in their lives. You know, we have a problem across the globe where before when people wanted to marry, this is a very important point. When people wanted to marry, marriage was arranged. It was arranged. The boy was good. The, the, the girl was good. Everyone was okay. No one had a story or so on and things worked because each one went into marriage with the idea of serving the other and things worked. Nowadays, in a lot of the parts of the globe, communication is so sophisticated that by the time a girl gets to 16, she's got someone in mind. And by the time a boy gets to a certain age, he's got someone in mind. If your communication with your child is good, they will keep you up to date with what they are thinking and what they are doing. But if your communication is bad, it will come to you as a shock and that child may elope. They may run away from you because they want to get to a person whom they love and love is blind. So rather from the very beginning, educate your children about marriage that look, don't be deceived by people. When you want to marry, these are the qualities you look for. And this is the type of spouse you need. The mother of your children, this is what you need. And this is what needs to happen and so on. And please, if there is anyone you ever show an interest in before it is too late, please, can you talk to me and we will help you. We want goodness for you. We don't want evil for you. It is time we open the doors of that type of communication with our children. Because the world is changing. I have come across cases where people tell me that I am ready to sacrifice my parents, but I'm not going to sacrifice this girl. Finished. When you hear that, you start thinking there is something wrong. You don't need to sacrifice your parents. I will talk to them. Then when you talk to the parents, they say, no way is over my dead body. So I tell them, just pretend to be dead for a while and it will happen. So 
This is what it is. Communication needs to be taken to a new level. There is lack of communication in most homes because even the husband and the wife don't communicate. How are we going to communicate with the children? Sometimes the mother is very close, so she knows everything. And the father disagrees with most of the things, so no one talks to him. So now what happens is it already polarizes the situation where everything that you want to get done, you just tell your mother about. And everything else, you might want to talk to your father maybe. May Allah protect us. Communication is of utmost importance. We need to open the doors. They might come with something absurd. I had a case where a man came to me, a man came to me, and he told me, you know, my child is gay. My child is gay. 18-year-old boy is gay. I looked at him and I said, look, we can counsel him. We can talk to him. We can try and see what depth and, you know, why are you saying this? He says, no, I just heard from someone and I beat him up and I broke his bones and he has now been hospitalized. I told him, brother, that's not the way to deal with things. You cannot take away someone's wrong inclinations by beating them. You can address the issue and you can tackle it intellectually and you can convince them and talk to them because it is a free world. Otherwise, they'll go away. And there are many people who are ready to give them refuge. So when I went to visit this young man, he was in a very poor condition. He was not prepared to give up anything. He admitted. He says, I'm admitting, so what? I've already been beaten. My bones are already broken. Now what? What more can you do? Kill me. Kill me if you want. You know, this statement comes out of some children. And it took a long time. Alhamdulillah, we succeeded to talk to him over a period of time. And Alhamdulillah, now he is married with children. But what I am saying is, you cannot solve a problem with violence. Never. Not in the home. Violence is a sign of weakness and insecurity. When a man comes and wants to beat people, he himself is foolish. He is insecure. He has nothing besides his, his, the, the, the venting of his frustration through, through physical means to offer. That's a sign that he's not a man. He wants to beat people up. Violence in Islam does not resolve any matter. Never. It doesn't solve a problem. It will compound the problem and create even a bigger problem. Because if you have a person who, for example, believes that 5 plus 5 is 11, you cannot roll your sleeves and start beating them. You need to sit them down, start drawing things, maybe get two little buckets, Put five fruits in one and five in the other. Tell him now, please, can you count them? He will get to 10 and stop. You solve the problem. You thought of a solution rather than beating him up. Beating up, if beating up taught people that five plus five was 10 today, before the O-level exam, we would put all the children in one line and give them 10 shots each. And after getting whacked, they would go and know all the answers. That's not how it is. Rather, you need to talk, you need to explain, you need to come up with intellectual solutions. You need to come up with you using your brain. You need to come up with something that the child will be convinced about. Because there are two things. A child either listens to you out of fear or the child is either convinced and does it. And in Islam, we are taught to convince the child. When Salah is read, when Salah is fulfilled, up to a certain age, the children might be doing it out of fear. But after a certain age, you need to know that they must be doing it out of their own responsibility, understanding that this is what is required of me. Because if you are going to force the child by beating the child to read Salah in your presence, the Salah is done. But when you are not there, there's no Salah. Why? Because you beat the child in order to get there. 
But if you explain to the child, look, salah is so important. It is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created you, who gave you the life, the one and so on. And the child watches you doing the same happily, happily. Then naturally you will have a solution to that. And the child will be fulfilling the salah wholeheartedly. So that is, we were speaking about being fair and equal when it comes to your children. We spoke about communicating with your child. Very, very important. Then the education of your child is something extremely important. What type of schools do you send your child to? Can I inform you why we say that it's very important? There are two environments inside the house and outside the house. Nowadays, the environment outside the house has a bigger impact upon an individual than the environment inside. The environment outside has a bigger impact on an individual than the environment inside. The friends have a bigger impact than the parents so what the parents should do is try and help the child choose friends try and help the child choose friends by sending them to schools where there are decent people where the discipline levels are high because sometimes we've had parents who come to us and say i don't know where i went wrong I tried my best to give my child the best upbringing but now suddenly after so many years the child is like this and like that and I normally tell them do you know that it is the friends who have a bigger impact so you might have given them a very good upbringing but you never took an interest in the friends of your children we need to take an interest in the friends of our children who are their friends how do they select friends? Have we ever spoken to them about that? What type of friends should you have? Sometimes those friends are imposed on them by the school because they are sitting right next to a person. You don't choose who you're going to sit next to at school. Suddenly that person talks to you every single day and you swap numbers and so on and you happen to talk and visit each other and the qualities of that friend come into your child. That friend might be from a totally broken home, fully confused, and that confusion will seep to your child. Why? Because we did not train the child what type of friends to have and what to take from a friend. You don't take everything from your friend. But we never ever spoke to our children in this regard. So it's important to know that where we send our children plays a big role in determining what type of a child that child will be. Also, what is of prime importance is when we develop a link with the ulama, when we as parents have a link with the scholars of deen, naturally our children will incline towards the scholars. When we are distant from the ulama, when we have nothing to do with the scholars of religion, when we are far from them, when we speak ill about them, the children will be the furthest away from the scholars of this religion. And that is dangerous. Also, we need to, as I said yesterday, we need to strike a balance between secular education and Islamic education. The secular education will help a child for a few years but the Islamic education will take the child through life and beyond life after death sometimes you have parents who concentrate on the education of their children spend lots of money make them something very big you know a highly qualified accountant and a few days after graduation, big car accident and the child died. May Allah protect us all. Did that qualification help the child? No. When the child goes in the grave, is the child going to be asked, 
about accounts. They tell us more about Ernest and Young. Tell us more about this and that. No. In the grave, the religious knowledge will now help. So that is why the child who has no religious knowledge will curse his or her parents. That Ya Allah punish them. Because they taught me something that was not even going to help me. And if it did, it was going to help me for a short while. But they never told me about this meeting of ours. They never told me that I would get into the grave. I didn't know how to read Quran. I didn't know anything. I didn't understand the message of Allah and His Messenger. I was never sent to any institution and so on. So this is why it's important for us to realize that when we attend a function like this, naturally our children will also be enthusiastic to attend. But when we are disinterested, our children will also be disinterested. So the link you have with the scholars of deen, inshallah, will open the doors of contentment within your home. You know, I have mentioned a lot and I have spoken of many points. And I hope and I pray that I have covered all three aspects of what I had intended to cover. One was the parent-parent relation. The other is the parent-child relation. And the, uh, the third is the child-child relation. It's important we understand all three categories. The most important is the parent-parent. Because if the parents themselves happen to be leading an exemplary life, automatically the upbringing of children becomes easy. Becomes very easy. But if the parents are in a chaotic state, naturally the children will be harmed by that chaotic state. And they will be in greater chaos. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the doors for all of us. And we hope and pray that we have learned something uh, tonight connected to this topic. And we hope and pray that everyone who has come here will take away something. And we definitely need to take it seriously. We definitely need to take it seriously. Every one of us, there is room for improvement. Tonight when we go home, make peace in the house. Start, start learning how to smile in the house. Start learning to say good statements to your spouse. Start learning to resolve matters. Start learning to stop interfering in the lives of others. Start learning to become people who make others' lives easy, not difficult. So that when you die, people can really say this person lived such a life that they always helped others. They always made life easy for others. We need to start doing this. And the husbands, really, there is room for improvement when it comes to the relations with the wives and the wives as well. Many wives are guilty of not appreciating what their husbands do for them. The man goes out in the morning and comes back in the evening in order to earn, in order to put a plate of food in front of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all appreciation. And may He make us from those who can appreciate everything that is done for us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Ya Allah, we ask you to have mercy on us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, have mercy on us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to open the doors of mercy for us, Ya Allah. Forgive us, Ya Allah. Forgive our shortcomings. We are human beings, Ya Allah. We have a human nature, Ya Allah. We err, we make mistakes, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, forgive us. Grant us steadfastness. Keep us away from shaitan and keep shaitan away from us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us good health, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us good health, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, those who are sick and ill in any way, Ya Allah, grant them cure, Ya Allah. Those who have passed away, have mercy on them, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us exemplary parents, Ya Allah. May Ya Allah, improve our relations, Ya Allah. Make us exemplary parents and Ya Allah, protect our children, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, grant us all forms of goodness, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you all the goodness that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has asked and we seek protection from all the evil he has sought protection from. Antal musta'an alayka al-bala wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-alil azim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa